It's hard to imagine a world where your wage or occupation would dictate the clothing that you could wear in your daily life, where being seen outdoors in the wrong shirt could land you in prison. But between the 13th and the 18th centuries, English sumptuary laws did exactly that. Sumptuary laws are seen throughout history in England, Europe and the wider world, though the specifics of each statute or petition varied. The overwhelming theme of each was to regulate consumption through an economic, social and moral lens. Sumptuary legislation can tell us more about the average person's appearance and lifestyle during the medieval and early modern period, but these laws covered much more than just clothing. In fact, they could regulate banquets, festivities, funerals, and even modes of transport. Sumptuary laws and the restrictions they entailed played into the innate social hierarchy of the time. Groups like knights, royalty, or clergymen wanted to demonstrate their place in this hierarchy, as well as to distinguish themselves from their direct inferiors. Clothing and hairstyles were the perfect visual tool to aid in this task. At its highest level, sumptuary legislation helped to distinguish the royal family from the bulk of society. For instance, in Tudor England, only Henry VIII was allowed to wear purple cloth or cloth of gold and silk. And in 1337, no one apart from the king, queen or their children was allowed to wear cloth imported from beyond England, Ireland, Wales or Scotland. This particular statute also reveals the additional economic motive that underlay sumptuary laws. By banning foreign cloth imports for everyone apart from the royal family, the legislation protected local industries against ever-growing global competition. Many of these calls for regulation came from the commons or lower house of the medieval parliament. This was made up of men who represented the surrounding communities such as knights, esquires or gentlemen. When demand for luxurious clothing and fabrics rose, those items became less obtainable and excessively expensive, so statutes like that of 1337 would stimulate the economy at home, whilst simultaneously limiting demand for lavish textiles, making it more affordable for the men in the commons. These statutes could be so detailed that a person's wage or line of work could be easily determined from the clothing they wore. For instance, a statute in 1363 proclaimed that agricultural workers and people with fewer than 40 shillings in goods or chattels could only wear blanket and russet wool worth 12 pence. At the other end of the spectrum, later legislation in 1478 stated that only people with incomes of over £20 were allowed to wear silk, camlet or imported wool. This might seem a little unfair to the lower classes, especially in this modern age of mass-produced clothing, chemical dyes and ever-changing fashions, but evidence from surviving artefacts, wills and inventories suggests that the majority were content with these restrictions. Though most people complied with the rules laid out in sumptuary legislation, some violations were inevitable, particularly in an age of such extreme growth for the international clothing trade. In 1565, a Londoner named Richard Walwyn was apprehended for wearing a very monstrous and outrageous great pair of hose. His hose were stripped from him and publicly displayed for all to see, and Richard himself was detained until he received a more lawful and decent replacement. In some instances, multiple people could suffer from these rule violations. The 1611 Act commanded that apprentices must only wear such decent apparel as is fitting and their masters well able to afford them. If an apprentice was found to violate this legislation, they would be taken to little ease for 18 hours. This was a prison which was too small to stand upright in. Their master would also be fined three shillings and fourpence for every day that their apprentice dressed inappropriately. So, though tailors were developing innovative styles and fashions, making the most of new textiles and silhouettes, much of this clothing was reserved for the elite. Sumptuary legislation gave society's hierarchy a visual element 
And today, it gives us a fascinating insight into the trends and changes that were happening at the time. The one thing we can be absolutely certain of is that we wouldn't have legislation banning something if people weren't actually doing it. And sometimes, people went to great lengths to get around the laws. And they didn't just apply to clothes. During the reign of Elizabeth I, a number of Italian swordmasters came to London and began a fashion for a new way of fighting. This was based around the use of the rapier, a long and relatively slender weapon that often had a highly ornate hilt. It rapidly became accepted that the longer the blade, the better the weapon. In 1562, a law was passed banning the use of gold to decorate the hilts of swords if you were of a lower status than that of a knight of the realm but it also universally limited the length of their blades. If your sword was found to be too long, you'd be fined and it would be confiscated and the blade broken. But this didn't stop people. The Royal Armouries in Leeds has in its collection a beautiful example of an extendable sword. When sitting in its scabbard on your belt, it doesn't appear to break any laws, but a small catch on the hilt allows the sword to be extended by some 20 centimetres or 8 inches. To modern sensibilities, a lot of these restrictions seem to simply be banning poor people from looking good. But there was a very real fear at the time that the fabric of society might unravel if people couldn't tell the difference between a marchioness and a milkmaid.